so um, just pick up where you left off. And I think uh, Senator Polina said you got up to page 14. Is that what he said? Um, yes, yeah, so that's section four. Okay. So it's page 15 in the as introduced version. Okay, great. Okay, um, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so I will continue from section four in H449. Um, yesterday, we went through the um, changes to the Vermont Pension Investment Committee. Now the commission um, that changed the membership and the duties of that, that committee. Um, and the next few sections are dealing with current law in statute um, that uh, there are some references to the committee response, the commission's responsibilities in the state employee retirement system board language, the teacher's language and the municipal language that had to be changed um, to sort of uh, update the cross references with respect to the new um, requirements of the commission and new responsibilities. So um, I will just uh, highlight, they're, they're gonna be very repetitive, but it just had to be changed um, several times. So um, section four, starting with the re retirement board for the state employees retirement system. Um, there is a new requirement that the actuarial, uh, exp the experience study, the actuarial investigation will be done at least once in every three year period rather than a five year period. So you'll see this change being made in all three statutory sections. So this first section is three VSA 471. And that's with respect to the state employees retirement board. Um, so line um, in the as introduced version, it's, it's line 21 on page 15. Um, section five is also dealing with um, the state employees retirement system. Um, I mentioned uh, yesterday that this, the state employees retirement system language had some language in there um, to the standards of conduct that would be adopted by the treasurer for VPIC. Um, that language is now moved into section, um, section two of the bill that VPIC will be uh, adopting their own standards of conduct for, for their own commission. So um, section five is, uh, is deleting the references to the treasurer adopting those rule standards of conduct for members of VPIC. And then the treasurer will be only doing this for members of the the Board of Trustees for the State Employees Retirement System. Are there any questions on that? Nope, okay. So this is gonna kind of be repeating that those same concepts three, two more times. So section six is making um, the change from the five year to the three year period for the actuarial investigation in the Teachers <laughs> Retirement System Board uh, language. And you'll see that on page 17, line 20. And then section seven um, is still in the teacher's system. Um, again, deleting the references to um, the treasurer adopting standards of conduct for the for VPIC. So the treasurer would only be doing this, um, adopting these rules with respect to the board of trustees for the state retirement, teacher's retirement system. Section eight of the bill is again um, in the municipal system, um, changing that uh, length of that uh, actuarial investigation from a five-year period to a three-year period. And then section nine is um, again, just uh, actually this section did not have any references to VPIC's uh, standards of conduct, but I did change all of the references um, to it being 
a committee to a commission in this section of law. Okay. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is not, well, it's a technical question, but it has nothing to do with anything else pretty much. But on line 16, what is an obligor? <laughs> um, line, sorry, I'm not <clears throat> sure we're on the same line. Oh, a manner of any. It's, it's current law. I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. What... Um, so somebody who has, who has uh, loaned, I think it's somebody who loans money to the, to the board. Okay. Thank you. Is it, it's that to body to whom you are obligated? Is that what I'm, I don't see it. Is, are, are you or in uh, any manner an obligation? It's current law. It's current, it's law. current law. Forgive me for asking. I shouldn't have asked the question. I, I don't want us to get sidetracked into something that isn't. I apologize. Ah, I see it. It's just fine. It, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Becky. Okay. <laughs> Uh, section 10 is setting up the task force um, to the pension benefits design and funding task force. And this is specifically for the state employees retirement system and the state teachers retirement system. Um, so subsection A, A creates this task force and they're looking at reviewing and reporting on the benefits design and funding of retirement and retiree health benefits for the state employee system, the teacher system. The membership of the board consists of three members from the house, not from the same political party who are appointed by the speaker of the house. There's three members from the Senate, not all from the same party who are appointed by the committee on committees. The director of the retirement division is um, on the board from the office of the state treasurer. There's the commissioner of financial regulation. Oh, sorry, I saw a question. Can I ask a chair a question? Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> Becky, in your long experience in legislative council, when we have wanted um, a, an array of political parties represented or perspectives, have we done anything different than say, not of the same political party? That is our standard template for, for referencing not of the same, different polit political parties. Okay, I think because this is such a topic of interest, if there's a way to ask others in ledge council, like have we ever worded? I, I, so, I've I mean, never that, seen anything other than that worded, but let's, this, that's, a, that's not a question of the drafting, that's a question of, of the content. So we- A Wednesday okay. conversation. If, okay. if somebody, if anybody has any other um, re remembrance that we do it in any other way, I've never seen it any other way in all my yeah, years. Yeah, I mean, that, I would confirm that that is what our template is for committees. That being said, if, if you're trying to get at something specific, we can of course change the language to be more specific to whatever it is, the, the policy decision that the committee right. it wants right. to achieve, but that this is the standard language. That I was use. just looking for some kind of historical precedent in ledge council in case one exists. It was the drafting kind of question, but I'll leave it alone for now. But so for the we're not going to talk about whether they should the, the, there's going to be a conversation about this I can guarantee you but this is the drafting this is the way the drafting is done there will be conversation about whether this is the right policy or not but that's not a question for Becky okay you want to go on Sure. Um, so I think I got through the commissioners of financial regulation and human resources. Yep. There's also three members who will be appointed by the president of the Vermont NEA, uh, two members appointed by the president of the VSEA, and one member of the Vermont Troopers Association who's appointed by the president of that association. Um, the 
members from the House and the Senate, there's a restriction that they shall not be direct or indirect beneficiaries of either system, uh, the state employees or teachers retirement system. And then the members appointed by the NEA, the VSEA and the Troopers Association. Um, so I'm in subdivision 2B. Uh, they shall not be currently serving as a legislator or the spouse or partner of an individual currently serving as a legislator. Um, and then subdivision C says that if for those members that can uh, appoint a designee um, upon designation and a approval, um, those designees shall be the only representative of the designator to participate in the task force proceeding. So essentially you can only appoint one person to take your place um, throughout the, the period of time that the, the task force is meeting. Um, subsection C, um, this is where the powers and the duties of the task force are set out. So the task force is making recommendations about benefit provisions and appropriate funding sources along with other recommendations um, that are it deems are uh, appropriate. Uh, they have to be consistent with actuarial and governmental accounting standards as well as demographic and workforce trends and the long term sustainability of the benefit program programs. Um, so there's a list of some of the things that the the task force needs to consider. First, it will be setting a pension stabilization target number for both the state employees and the teacher's retirement system. And that number will be uh, reducing the actuarial accrued liability based on the actuarial value of assets by a sum that's equivalent to the amount of the increase from fiscal year to fiscal 21 to 22. Um, so this is trying to get at, is trying to reduce the amount of that number by the same amount that it uh, increased per the um, actuarial valuation and review that was reported on uh, June 30th of 2020 um, and for both, both the state employee and the teacher's system. And then same with the ADEC, um, it's, that number should reduce the actuarial determined employer contribution by an amount that's equal to what the amount increased from fiscal year 21 to 22 um, as reported for both of those systems. I don't remember what that number is off the top of my head, but I can get, I can uh, look it up and send it to you if uh, the committee would like that. It's okay. okay. <laughs> um, so the committee, the task force is also looking at a five-year review of benefit expenditure levels, as well as employer and employee contribution levels and growth rates on a three, five, and 10-year projection of these levels and rates. And then based on benefit and funding benchmarks, the, it will look at the proposed, proposed new benefit structures with the objective of adequate benefits within the um, established cost containment benchmarks. This would include an evaluation of um, a shared risk model for employer contributions and cost of living adjustments. It would also look at an estimate of the cost of current and any proposed benefit structures on a budgetary pay as you go and full actuarial accrual basis. Um, the committee, sorry, the task force will then evaluate the intermediate and long term economic impacts to the state and local economies and their potential impact on retiree spending. It will evaluate any cross subsidization between groups within the state employee system and adjust um, contribution amounts to eliminate that any cross subsidization. The task force will evaluate uh, alternative plan designs such as hybrid or defined contribution plan options or a combination of defined benefit and defined contribution plans. It will examine permanent and temporary revenue streams to fund uh, both systems and this would include a review of whether all or part of retirement income should be tax exempt. The task force will look at a plan for pre-funding OPEB benefits with an, evalu an evaluation of using federal funds to the extent that that might be permitted. And then finally, a plan to lower OPEB healthcare costs, including um, looking at health 
benefit design innovation, state regulatory methods, and alternative methods of providing pooled healthcare benefits. Subdivision two says that the task force is not going to be making recommendations on adjusting the assumed rates of return. Subsection D is stakeholder input. So the task force before they make any recommendations is going to solicit input, including through public hearings from affected stakeholders. And that includes those impacted by issues of iniquities. It will also consult with representatives designated by the Supreme Court, um, Group D members of the state employees retirement system and members of the state employee system who are employees of DOC. Subsection E is assistance. So the task force has um, administrative, technical, and legal assistance from the Office of the State Treasurer. There's fiscal assistance from the Joint Fiscal Office and committee support services from the Office of Legislative Operations. The task force is appropriated in subdivision two, um, $200,000 to contract for advisory services from an independent benefits expert and legal expert if necessary. And those are, um, would come from general funds. Subsection F, leave time. Um, so public employee members of the task force shall be granted reasonable leave time by their employees, employers to attend the task force meetings. Um, subsection G is a reporting requirement. Um, by September 1st of this year, the task force would submit a written report to the governor and the two government operations committees with findings and recommendations for legislative action. It would also be submitting a copy of this report to the boards of the state employees retirement system and the teacher system um, for their uh, consideration so they can comment to the legislature. Subsection H, in terms of meetings, um, the six legislative members appointed to the committee will appoint both a House and Senate member as co-chairs for the committee. And those co-chairs would call the first meeting of the task force by June 15th of this year. A majority of the membership shall constitute a quorum. And then the committee would cease to exist by June 30th of 2022. The legislative members in subsection I would be eligible to receive um, per diem compensation and reimbursement ex of expenses, and that comes from the legislative budget. budget. Um, the other members of the task force who are not uh, state employees shall receive um, uh, reimbursement and compensation, and that comes from money appropriated to the state treasurer. And for both of those, um, that compensation is limited to not more than 15 meetings. Uh, section 11 what is a way for our office to not have to go through all statute right now to make the change from Ve Vermont Pension Investment Committee to commission. So this allows Ledge Council during the stat rev process to, um, to go through all the cross-references and statute to clean up that language um, and replace committee with commission. I see that coming in a new technical bill next year. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, and then section 12 is the effective date. So it takes effect on passage. Great, any questions for Becky about the um, drafting of it? Nice work. Yeah. Nice work. That was a anyway, we're appreciative. Good. So committee, um, I have I went through this and have a number of questions that I think are beyond um, Becky's. It, they're more why questions, but just for example. If the report is due on September 21st, why does the committee continue to, the task force continue to exist for another seven months or nine months? I mean, just oh. stuff like that, that I think is 
technical, it isn't substantive uh, around um, the policies, but it's um, just, so can we- We have, we have Sarah and John here, so those are good time to ask those questions. Yeah, that's, I was just going to ask committee if that was okay to just ask those kinds of questions. I don't want to um, necessarily get into why did you choose this policy over this policy? Because I think that's something we need to, um, we, we need to uh, hear testimony on and dig into ourselves. But if it, is it okay for us and do other people have those kinds of questions that might be pretty technical, but beyond um, Becky's, uh, she shouldn't have to answer for why something like that was done. Is that okay, committee? Yeah. We, okay, so Sarah or John, do you have a response to that particular one? I'm not sure that I have a strong um, response to it. I guess I would say um, that we may need members of the task force to to continue to participate in conversations uh, when the legislative session starts. Um, not that they would meet, but that we might want to call them to, to testify. Um, Representative Gannon, you, you may have another thought on why that's there. No, uh, um, Madam Chair, I, I, or Representative copeland Haza, I, I think you're, you're correct. That's why the language is there. So if there's a need for them to testify before the legislature, they'll have the opportunity to do so. I've seen that language in other summer study, summer study bills. Okay. Okay. I just I'd never seen that before, but okay, thank you. Yeah. Senator Rob, did you have a kind just, of a technical question? I think or, so. I, I can let Senator Clarkson was like a follow-up. I think she had a follow-up to yeah, that. No, I, just sure. want to follow up. I, I think it makes total sense that they given that it will be live as an issue all during next session it makes total sense that the that the group of people who are most not who have invested the most in uh in it be there either to meet and resolve things and come back with a further recommendation i i think it makes sense for them to still exist okay. because they may have further work to do yeah no i just wondered i just was curious um, Senator Rahm? I, I would just be curious, um, with the draft that Treasurer Pierce, or the kind of proposal Treasurer Pierce released <clears throat> as the session started, and then the draft that you all started looking at, I believe in March, what were some really important differences to you that had felt, you know, like that was what you wanted to, to have counter proposals around? Are, are you talking specifically about the, the pension, the benefits package that was presented? Because we're, we're not going to get into the benefits package. Right. I guess I'm just curious, you know, like as this committee does its public process, you know, was there anything that you felt was, was critical about what you have put forth in the study, um, you know, that you sort of didn't see originally? in the treasurer's proposal. So you're asking if there's anything that we put in the duties of the task force that was responsive to some of those uh, issues that were identified between the treasurer's proposal and the house proposal? I guess what I'm getting at is we heard from some folks that it felt prescriptive. So I'm just wondering if you could respond to that. How, how do you think there are ways that that you know you 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 do want there to be some prescriptive nature of this discussion? And what's important to you about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it felt important to us as we were having conversations in committee and also looking at how um, interim study committees on other topics have uh, have either succeeded or failed. Um, it felt important to us to uh, to direct the the task force on a couple of issues to focus on um, and or not focus on in the case of adjusting the rate of return um, and uh, and so that's why it looks fairly directive because otherwise it is a vast challenge and um, and it could be difficult to know where to begin. And what 
what made you sort of feel like the governance change, the overall governance changes make a really big difference to what happens moving forward? Um, so the, I think the transparency and the, um, and the, the stress testing is very important to us uh, and, and we believe will, will help make improvements going forward, uh, as well as the, the creation of spots within the commission that will, uh, that will be occupied by independent financial experts. Um, because we know that it's important for beneficiaries of the system to ha have, uh, you know, a seat at that table with that investment committee. But we also know that, you know, that that there are uh, there are certain skill sets that are um, resident within people who are financial experts uh, that that you also want to have at that table so that there can be a dialogue um, and, a, and a full understanding. And also, you know, frankly, a, a critical eye ab about advice that may be coming from, uh, from someone advising the investment committee. So, yeah, Sarah Colomore. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm just looking at the dates again, and I'm sure you guys took a look at what you wanted to lay out in terms of a process. They start on June 15th. They have to have a report done by September 1st. And if I did my math, that leaves them 77 days to come up with a report. And they're limited to 15 meetings. It seems like there's a lot of compression. If, they're, if they are going to take advantage of the 15 meeting situation, they're going to be meeting quite often. Um, during those 77 days, correct? What well, I guess what I'm what I'm asking is, <clears throat> would it make more sense to make the report due a little later, or was there a specific reason that September 1st was chosen? Does that there make were, sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate the question because this was a source of tension within uh, the committee. There were, were there were some voices at the table who were saying. Um, you know, our retirement system is, is you know, ble bleeding money every single month we don't want to delay. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, any changes that would require legislation wouldn't be able to be made until January anyway. So then, you know, then the question becomes, well, why not, uh, why not give the task force until December to finish its work? Uh, but the other reality is that we we would expect that that there will be members of the government operations committee, possibly on both sides, who who may need to sit on this task force. And we have another uh, very important um, once in a decade project coming up this fall, which is on the House side a little more intense uh, because we need to get feedback from the boards of civil authority uh, with respect to redistricting. And so we are already gonna have uh, as a house committee, uh, a fair number of late fall, early winter um, meetings that we will need to have around the state, hopefully by Zoom, um, uh, but probably also in person. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it became clear that it's gonna be a very, very busy November and December. Am I correct though, Sarah, in remembering that the the Census Bureau won't release their uh, data until the end of September. I believe that's true. September 30th, I think. That was the official announcement. Yes, I think that I heard since then that they think they might be able to beat that timeline. Okay, all right. Well, as I said, I'm sure you took all this into consideration when you came up with the timelines. I was just curious. Yeah, happy to answer the question. And I have a, I have a couple um, kind of technical that I would consider technical. On the uh, the um, I guess it's the VPIC, not on the task force, but on the VPIC. The um, if the chair is first of all, there's a chair that's um, appointed by the other members. I mean, I mean, it, it's a, a separate. It's not one of their members. It's a separate person that comes on, and then there's a vice chair that is elected by the members. But if the, um, and there's no qualifications, I don't think for the chair, but if the chair is unable to do their responsibilities, 
they appoint an interim chair who shall be a financial expert or independent, not the vice chair. And I just, I was just curious about that. It, it seemed like an odd um, thing that you have a vice chair, but the vice chair doesn't do anything because if the chair can't do it, there has to be an interim. Right. I <laughs> see, I see the conundrum that you have uncovered and I would welcome Representative Gannon to share any thoughts that he might have. Um. I, I think that, that that's a good comment, Senator White. Um, it, it, you're right. I mean, we want to, you know, if the chair can't perform his duties, um, there's a chair, an interim chair appointed until he can, and it has to be an independent and financial expert. And the vice chair doesn't, isn't required to be a financial expert. I think um, that could be something that could be fixed. But but so that it isn't the expectation that the vice chair would take over that there would be a, an interim chair from outside appointed just as the um, original chair was appointed from the outside of the board right is that uh, I'm just checking on that so the vice chair really doesn't do anything. I think you're right. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the, the page number, but um, just popping in the, the language says the members of the, the commission will appoint the vice chair, but in the instance that the chair can't serve, um, they, they can appoint an interim chair. Sorry, where, where are, where? Sorry, I'm just, I'm finding it out. Just give me one moment. Yeah. So the chair isn't required to have, I thought. The... Okay, it's, um. well, in the as introduced version, it's on page six, it's, um, under member terms, subdivision two. So member terms are subsection C yeah. in um, section 522. Yeah, and so may, may I ask a question? Or are we gonna, well, the, there are lots of questions about the chair. Uh, it, you have uh, basically a quite long terms. I mean, it's very unusual to, I see for a board uh, to go beyond t ability to serve up to 10 years. So you have people able to serve for 12 and yet the chair is able to serve for 20 years. I mean, most people say doing a job for 10 years and then they should move on. What gave you the notion that somebody could serve up to 20 years? I mean, they are pretty worn out after 20 years. I mean, usually as, as, Leadership is often done and sort of thought about in ten-year chunks, right? And and I can certainly let uh, Representative Gannon jump in on this because he's quite familiar with where this came from. So first of all, um, under the current BPIC statute, there are no term limits at all. Um, right. People serve as long as they want to, um, as long as they're reappointed. Um, and so we do have at least two members who have served since two thousand five. Um, so the concept with respect to the chair serving um, 20 years is, first of all, unlike the other members of VPIC, um, the chair is elected um, by the members of VPIC. Um, so, you know, we thought that he could have a longer term um, than the members themselves. That's a super longer term. And, and, and I will say that this was a recommendation from Brooke, the treasurer, and the chair of VPIC. Thanks. Senator Rahm. When you were thinking about the independent commission, did you talk with Chris or others about how this compares to governance bodies around the country? If, do they have advisory boards? You know, what, what are some best practices that you think are really important in the bill? Or, and what did you sort of decide? It's interesting that we can't make that happen right now. So um, th there are two models, or there, there's multiple models of how pension boards are set up. Um, but the model that we follow is having separate pension boards 
um, that deal with the administrative issues with the pensions and then have a separate basically investment committee. Um, that is a fairly common model um, that's out there that other states follow. Um, I think what we focused on in committee is the importance of the independence of that committee, um, a balance of all the, of the, the different stakeholders, which is consistent with the research at a Boston College Center for Retirement Research. Um, so we did look at that. Um, but I mean, I think we were just focused um, primarily in committee on ensuring that there, there wasn't, that VPIC did not become politicized um, and that it, it was more independent from the treasurer's office. And we heard testimony from both the treasurer and the chair of VPIC that that was very important um, to them. Um, so I think that, that was the driving force for that change. Thanks, because it, it was it was interesting to hear Tom mention that 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 they were in the process of moving that direction anyway. Yes, they are. They have an RFP out for um, a study that's contemplated in the bill, um, so they're already moving forward with looking at a new governance structure that would be much more independent from the treasurer's office. And, and I really do think it, it's important because if you look at other states and how they have set assumed rates of return. Um, Vermont's not alone in having set its assumed rate of return higher than probably was it should have been. Um, and so what we're trying to do is ensure that VPIC in setting that assumed rate of return is looking at the markets and at the you know independent investment data that's out there to set that return rather than being concerned about oh, if we set the return here or down here, it's going to impact the ADAC payment. Um, that is something we're very concerned about because if you look at the past history of our assumed rate of return, um, we have missed it on a number of occasions. And you can look at other states and see the same thing. And you have to wonder if politics enters into the decision of how to set the assumed rate of return because it lowers budgetary pressure because you reduce the amount of the ADAC in a given year. Unfortunately, it hits you in the back end because in the next year, your unfunded liability goes up if you don't make your assumed rate of return. So I have just a really, did that, I'm sorry, did that answer your question, Senator Ram? Is that my question? Is that well, my it was, yeah, you had asked a question about, okay. That's so correct. now I have a I question that, and Alan this is really call. picky. This is really picky. Under sections, you've always talked about an independent VPIC, but in section three, where um, it calls it a standalone entity instead of, uh, is there a difference between an independent entity and a standalone entity? Sorry, where are you, Jeanette? Well, I'm on section three. I know, but what page? For well, I think I'm looking at a different page than you are. So just forward to section three. Okay, I'm trying. I'm because trying. I'm looking at the draft before, because I printed that out and it's on page 13 on my draft. Page, oh, but 14, I, Allison, page 14. Thank okay. you. Got it. And I just wondered, I know that's really, really picky, but I just wondered if there is a difference here. Um, um, I think, you know, what um, BPIC and the Treasurer's Office are, are working through right now is an, a memorandum of understanding that would make BPIC um, more of a standalone entity with its own employees um, that aren't in the Treasurer's Office. So um, Tom Galaka referenced that there were three employees that work for, for BPIC, Eric Henry, who's the Chief Investment Officer, and two others. I think they would move into VPIC as a standalone organization. And I think you should talk to Tom Blanca about that um, next week. Um, I can't hear you, Madam Chair, sorry. Well, of course you can't hear me because I was on mute and I'm on mute because I've got a lot of noise out here. <laughs> but so about, we'll talk about whether, why the two different terms. Okay. Any other questions right now? Yes, yeah, Senator Rahm. Talk to other members of the, of the current former VPIC 
or do you feel like they really spoke with one voice through Tom? So um, Tom um, presented our, our governance structure um, to the VPIC board mm -hmm. and they voted unanimously to accept it with a couple of exceptions. They did not um, discuss or, or vote on term limits and one other, oh, whether a legislator should be on VPIC or not. They did not vote on those two issues, but they voted on the rest of the governor's structure. They made some recommendations um, for modifications that were in a memo that you can find on our page. And we made those changes in this draft of the bill, or I should say this bill. And those two issues are policy issues. Right. The, the term limits and the budget. Or, or whether there should be term limits or right. not. Right, right. Senator Clarkson, did you start to say something? No, no, I just I just wanted to clarify, did they not vote on those because they disagreed or they felt that they were going to leave them to us to make those decisions? I, I, I think those, given that a current member of the legislature sits on VPIC, I think that was a controversial issue. And we can, I, I think also with respect to term limits, uh, given the fact that there are a, a couple of members of VPIC who have been there since 2005 was, was why they avoided um, taking a right. stand on term limits. Yeah, thank you. You had mentioned that. Yeah. Term limits are so standard now. Any other questions? They are, I just hope they don't get imposed on the legislature because that's a really, I think, dangerous. No, I've seen it in Maine and I've seen how it, it is just a shell game. But anyway. Um, no, I'm sure we'll have more once we. Oh, oh, I know we'll have more, but I, I wanted us to talk not about the policy questions no. here, but just no, but about no. if we had technical kind of questions for that. Um, well, I have a technical question just given the timing and how we're gonna make this all happen and how, because you don't actually call out three employees and you don't actually fund them in this bill. So, uh, I mean, I, it, it, this, is, that's, this is really granular, but one that has to be done uh, if we're gonna proceed with it. And if it's gonna make its way either through the budget or as an independent bill, however, so um, I take it that that is work that we could do to add on and flush it out a little bit further. I didn't understand your question at all. Call out three employees? Right. This bill implies that, the, the, that there'll be three employees that will be part of this. Oh. I mean, they're currently, I guess, was your thought that they were already paid for and they were already in the budget and they would just be moving? Got it. Okay. Okay. And, and there's a report back to the legislature on January 15th, 2022, with respect to their recommendations, with respect um, to their change into a standalone independent commission, which is when we could tackle the issue of how we fund this. But I will say that um, VPIC it, and some of the treasurer's office functions have been funded through the retirement plans. I mean, their costs are, are borne by their retirement plans. So as they move to an independent office, um, okay, well, was, we can chat about that, I guess. You can, Tom Delacca can provide you with information on that and what other states have done. And Chris Roop can, can provide that information too. For example, two states that have similar models are um, Massachusetts um, and Wisconsin. Anything else this afternoon that we should look at? So I, I would suggest that if you have on uh, either the on either section, and again, we're I'm going to try to be very. <laughs> Sorry, I've been trying to keep myself unmuted, but then there was a lot of noise here. So I'm going to try to be very careful about keeping the two the two um, main themes here divided so that we don't start wandering around in both of them because I think 
because I think there are two distinct areas here to deal with. One is governance and one is the task force. So as you go through this, and I know you're gonna spend all weekend reading this and trying to figure it out and angsting about it. So as you go through it though, and come up with any questions, like I have a list of questions, I would like to have you send them to me so that we can get them posted so that when Steve and Jeff and um, the treasurer and who I tried to um, suggest that we have come in, um, I have too many pieces of paper. On, um, on Tuesday? On Tuesday, so we, is that, do we look at the, um, the governance issue, and we have Tom Golick, the treasurer, and Golanka, the treasurer, um, the people that are going, the, un, the three unions, the um, VLCT, because um, Beamers is going to be part of the VPEC, um, the people that are involved, uh, the treasurer's office, that have them come in. But if they can have some sense ahead of time of what some of our policy questions will be that we'll be wrestling with. I think that would be helpful to them so that they can look at those questions. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else or not, but if I were coming in to testify, I would, and I were Jeff Gannon, Jeff Fannin, as opposed to John Gannon, I would um, like to be able to know what some of the concerns were beforehand. Not, and, and, and Senator Clarkson, we're not gonna limit it to those, but just give them a sense ahead of time if we can. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody else. So if nobody else wants to send questions to me, that's fine, I'll just post mine. We'll work on it. You've given us homework. We'll, we're, 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 we'll get, and when do you want them to you by? 5.30? Today? <laughs> so if, do we have a study hall now? Do you promise the phone won't ring? <laughs> no. Email. Um, I can do 5.30 if they're no interruption. <laughs> no, just sometime. And, and then if they don't get, if you don't get them to me, that's fine. You can ask them when we're. Just, just, just sometimes, just sometimes doesn't work. You give us a, give, do you want them by Sunday night? Do you want no. them by Monday at lunch? We're meeting Tuesday afternoon. I'd like them by Monday afternoon. Okay. Right. Does that work? Governance questions to you by Monday afternoon. And benefit the task force questions by Tuesday. Okay. Perfect. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thanks for spending Friday afternoon with us.